It is such an honor to be here. I'm here, this is my 12th passion. I've gotten here with my kids, Catherine and Sophia. They started coming when they were four and eight. And Catherine flew all the way from London, England to say, I cannot miss passion. And so all the Aussies, who are all the Aussies in the room? Come on, you let me down. Who's all the Americans in the room? <laughs> and we've got the whole world, over 100 nations online, I'm glad. How many Jesus lovers are in the room? <laughs> I'm gonna dive right into the word I believe. You know, God is so here already. If, if he does nothing else, this conference, we've already, already had so much. The songs, how many love the new songs that we're already singing? I gotta tell you, I nearly went into orbit. I reached um, Shelley and I said that song about witnessing, I'm, I'm ready to fly into orbit. By the time the conference is finished, you all will be. We're gonna go to the book of Exodus 33. You know we're serious when we're going to Exodus for the opening talk of passion. I'm just gonna bring you up to speed before we dive into the text. You don't have to freak out. I'm both Greek and a woman, so I only speak three ways, hard, fast, and continuously, so you won't go to sleep. I'll tell you that much as we dive in. But just before we dive into where I am, let me tell you, we're about to step into the story of a very traumatized people, a people not unlike the people living in 2023 as we kick into this year. What had happened up until this point, God had miraculously delivered the children of Israel out of bondage, out of slavery. He had performed signs and wonders and miracles, but somewhere along the line, like the people of God tend to do, they kind of forgot what God had done. Moses had gone up to the mountain. He'd been up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. He was getting the 10 commandments, the download from heaven, ready to help the people of God. But the people of God thought he had gone for too long. And sometimes when God doesn't kind of show up for us in the timing that we think he should show up for us, we end up doing some really dumb stuff. And so what happened in this context is they did some really dumb stuff. The, the children of Israel who had seen God do so many miracles decided, hey, Moses is taking too long up there in the mountains, so we kind of need another God. So they go to Aaron, look, we need you to build us this, this like golden calf because where they come from, from Egypt, that's kind of what they worshiped. And so Aaron being a really smart guy goes, take off all of your earrings, girls, guys, everyone take them off, throw them into, you know, we're gonna make this golden calf. Moses comes down from the mountain. The people are partying, the people are worshiping this calf. They've totally forgotten about God. And, and Moses is like, what is going on? And Aaron's like, I don't know. We just took our earrings off, threw them in the fire and bang. Dumb. Dumb. So as you can imagine, God was not really thrilled at this moment. His people had forgotten him. I mean, it was crazy. So it's in that context we're gonna pick up now at Exodus chapter 33. It says here in Exodus 33, the Lord spoke to Moses. Go up from here, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt to the land I promised to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob saying, I will give it to your offspring. I mean, I just wanna pause right here. Now remember, we've come into a story where the people of God had been entirely unfaithful to God. They had tired, totally turned away from God, began worshiping this golden calf, had totally forgotten Him. And yet the Lord says, you know what, Moses? I want you to get ready because I made a promise to your forefathers. I promised that I would take them into the promised land. And because I'm a God who keeps His promises, even though you were unfaithful, I cannot be anything but faithful. The power of the songs that we're singing tonight, oh, by the end of this conference, they're gonna go so much deeper. Because one of the best things that you and I at the outset of 2023 can be aware of, is that even when we have been unfaithful, which is the power that you saw in Sarah's story, our God's faithful. I don't know who I'm talking to tonight and it could be something right, someone right up in the back section, someone online on the live stream, 
and you think God could never use me, God could never do anything with me because I have been so unfaithful to God. But here is the promise of God that even in our unfaithfulness, our God cannot be anything but faithful. And I wanna remind you today, in a world that is full of unfaithful people, in a world that is full of people and institutions that break their promises, there is one thing that you can be absolutely sure of, that our God is faithful. Our God is always faithful. Our God will keep His Word. And He promised to be faithful. And He says, I I made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And even in your worst unfaithful state, my promise is not based on your faithfulness, it's based on who I am. There's a lot of people riding off the church and I just laugh because I think God is faithful. And you know what Jesus said? He said, I will build my church and guess what? The gates of hell cannot, shall not, will not prevail against the church of the living God. Our God is faithful. You know, a lot of us have come through some trauma and stuff over the last few years. We've been betrayed and let down. Your story may be one full of pain. And the way you view God is through the lens of the person that was unfaithful to you, through the lens of the person that hurt you, that violated you, through the lens of the person that walked out on you. But I want you to know that our God is entirely unlike us. That's why you can put all of your life into his hands and you can entirely trust him. It ought to be great comfort to you that God is nothing like you or me. He is entirely unlike us. He cannot be unfaithful to his promise. He cannot be unfaithful to his purpose in your life. And God's word is full of promises and Corinthians tells us that all of the promises of God are in Christ Jesus, yes and amen. So if God said it, God will do it. I know we are living in a world full of economic and political and environmental and sociological and moral craziness. The whole world has lost its mind, but I'll tell you who hasn't, God hasn't. The word of God, the promise of God, the purpose of God, it will prevail. It will prevail. It can't but not. You know, so often in life we think because we've messed up that God's gonna mess up. Or we think because we haven't kept our word, God won't keep his word. Or sometimes we look at our lives and it looks like our plan isn't coming to pass. And we think because God hasn't done something the way we thought he should do it, that he's not going to do it. God didn't say that he was going to be faithful to our plan, he's gonna be faithful to his purpose. He's gonna be faithful to his promise. And I wonder whether as we go into this year and many of you seeing us thinking about your future, have you even included God's purpose in your plan? Because you are gonna set yourself up for failure and you're gonna think that God has left you if God does not bless your purpose when you haven't even asked him what his plan is. It's God's plan that will, it's God's purpose that will prevail, not our plans. In a world that is all about follow your heart, follow your dream, follow your plan, God says, would you seek my purpose? Would you seek my will? Would you seek my plan for your life? And it won't always go how you thought, but He'll always be faithful. I can say that to you as a 56 year old woman standing before you. I'm the kid that was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted. I'm the kid that was sexually abused for 12 years. Grew up in the poorest zip code in my state in Australia, the third third poorest zip code in Australia. The enemy tried to quench God's purpose for my life. But God is faithful to His purpose. God is faithful to His promise. And if God spoke it over you, God will do it. And there is not a demon in hell or a person on earth that can thwart the purpose and the promise of God for your life. There is nobody that can thwart God's promise. All the promises of God are in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen. I don't know what might have happened to you, but I can tell you, you can trust your God to be faithful to you. 
You can trust your God that he will bring you where he wants to bring you, but don't get so caught up in your plan that you miss God's purpose. We have a generation that literally is on the edge of, I believe, ushering in the greatest harvest that we've ever seen. But let's not mix our plans, our dreams, our desires, our way, our methods, our strategy, our marketing, our platform building with the way God wants to do it. It's His promise that will prevail. And so if we say, God, I've got nothing but you, God says, that's all you need because I'll take you where you could never take yourself. I will do through you what you could never do through yourself. If God said it over your life, it doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you were raised. It doesn't matter what you think you did or you didn't have where you are or where you are not studying, who you do or who you do not know, as long as you surrender your heart and your life to the purpose of Jesus Christ, His promise will prevail in your life. You go, Chris, you sound so confident. Listen, when you get to 56 and you go, I was left in a hospital and today I'm standing in Atlanta, Georgia, all of these years later, I can tell you, I have seen storms and I've seen trials and I've seen mistakes and I've seen failures and I've seen tribulations and I'm standing here to testify to the faithfulness and the goodness of our God. He who promised is faithful. He's faithful. And he'll be faithful to you. So he goes on, I better move past verse one because we've still got a lot to go. Y'all are distracting me. He says, I will send an angel ahead of you and will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, Hethites, Pezites, Hevitites, Jebusites, all the ites, they're going. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up with you because you are a stiff, I love God, he's so subtle. Because you are a stiff necked people. Otherwise, I might destroy you on the way. You know, this is the mercy of God right here. It's the mercy of when my daughters are sitting there, they will testify that sometimes it's merciful. It's like, you know, um, their mother is like, you wanna go to your room and you don't want me to come. So it's just that. When the people heard this bad news, they mourned and didn't put on their jewelry. I want you to catch that. God said, I'm, I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna fulfill my promise. You're gonna go into a land flowing with milk and honey. You're gonna go into the promised land. But by the way, I'm not gonna come for your own good because God's a God of great compassion and mercy and love. And he's like, for your own good. But I'll send an angel. And the people, the very people that were just rebellious, were just worshiping a golden calf. They're like, oh no, this is not good. This is not good news that God has said He's not coming with us. I know God has said that we're gonna get the land of milk and honey. I know that God has said we're going to step into the promised land, but it's not good news that it says they mourned and didn't put on their jewelry. For the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I went up with you for a single moment, I will destroy you. Now take off your jewelry and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites remained stripped of their jewelry from Mount Horeb onwards. This is so powerful. The children of Israel, they went, hang on a minute. God, I know you said you're gonna send this angel. And I know you said that we're gonna go into the land that's flowing with milk and honey. I know that that's where your promise is. And, and we, were, we were in bondage in Egypt and, and now we're going into the land of milk and honey. But God, we do not wanna go if you're not gonna go. God, we don't want the promise if we don't have your presence. What purpose is the promise without the presence? I don't want the provision of God without the presence of God. I don't want the promise of God without the presence of God. No amount of success is worth the absence of God. I wonder what success it is that you're pursuing. What accolades, what accomplishments. And I'm not diminishing any of them, it's great. But if it's at the expense of the presence, why would you want it? We see successful people all over the world strung out on drugs, suicidal, depressed. 
Because the provision or the promise without the presence leads to emptiness. I wonder in our life whether we'd even notice that the plans that we're making are void of the presence of God. As we're thinking about our careers and we're thinking about our future and thinking about what it is that we wanna do, are we even saying, God, I actually don't even wanna go if you're not leading me? I don't care ultimately about that promotion or that level of success or that title or that accolade. Lord, if you're not in it, what's the point of me getting it and then not having you? They mourned. The same people that were worshiping a calf just a chapter before actually were like, hang on a minute. I I don't want just the stuff without God. I wonder whether we're using God for the stuff or whether he himself is what we want. His presence. And here they said, we don't wanna go if you are not gonna go. Now, of course, I'm not talking about the omnipresence of God, he's everywhere all the time. I'm talking about his presence very personally with us. Because there are some places we go that I'm telling you God's not there. I run a global anti-human trafficking organization. There is plenty of online activity that I'm telling you God's not on. And it amazes me how frequently we'll go and visit places God says, I'm just not going. I'm just not going. So I wonder in our lives, where we in our own lives, our own thoughts, our own actions, our own habits are willing to forsake the presence for momentary pleasure. I wonder. But here the children of Israel, every bit as disobedient as all of us, are going, I don't want that. I don't want to step into a place you're not gonna be. I don't even want the accolades of my friends, the awesome party, the awesome success, if you're not in it, God, because you are actually what I'm desiring. So there are some places that I'm not gonna go where my friends at college are gonna go because I know his presence isn't going there. So I'm not gonna go. So is it going to mean at times I might be a little bit lonely? Yes. But I'd rather be in the wilderness with God than in the promised land without him. I wonder, and truly, the measure that you are going to experience that is the degree to which you're willing to stay in the wilderness with God, rather than run into places where lots of other people are, but God's obviously not. Places that are contrary to the Word of God and walking obediently to the will of God. And our willingness to say, you know what, I'd rather be right here in the wilderness, it means I might not be in the in crowd, I might not be invited to the the cool thing, I might not be in, I am willing to be here in the wilderness with the presence of God than have all the other stuff and know God's not in it. God's looking for a generation that's willing in this hour of deep darkness on the earth to say, oh, I'm willing to be here with you, because I'm not going to go there without you. I am not going to do that without you. I'm not gonna hang out in those spaces without you. No matter what anyone thinks, here with you is better than there with everyone and know you. It's better. So he goes on. In verse seven, it says, now Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp. At a distance from the camp, he called it the tent of meeting. Anyone who wanted to consult the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent, and they would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance to the tent. And then the Lord would speak 
with Moses. As all the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance to the tent, they would stand up and then bow in worship, each one at the door of his tent. So it says that the, Moses took a tent of meeting and, and pitched it outside of the camp. Now this is not the tabernacle that we see in Exodus 40. This is a, a, a tent of meeting. It's kind of like, okay, we've got to set up a meeting place. And he sets up a meeting place outside the camp. So you had to have great intentionality to go to that meeting place. You had to decide, I'm gonna separate myself from everyone and I am going to go and have a time and a place with God. And God's looking for a generation that says, are you willing to set up and consecrate your heart, a place and a time with me? In a world full of distractions and a world full of other attractions and a world full of instant everything, are you willing to carve out time and space to come apart and meet with me in my word through worship, through prayer? Are you willing to come out and is my presence enough to lure you out of your normal, everyday, small life to find yourself in my presence. I'm standing here today at 56, and I keep saying that, because it's 35 years I started truly being a fully devoted follower of Jesus at Sydney University when I was your age. And I could tell you way back then, we would come every morning from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., And we would have prayer meetings and we would seek God. And I'm not just talking for one month or two months, I'm talking for years. You're wondering why I'm standing here still today. I don't have enough gift to keep myself here. Not enough talent. I've made mistakes. But I know God. And a hunger for His presence above everything else and that hasn't changed in 35 years. I wasn't looking for marketing plans and strategies and platforms. I did, they didn't even exist. I'm as old as the dinosaurs, so we didn't even have the internet. But I sought God. And so much of what we're seeing today, the fruit of A21, the fruit of Propel, way back then in the late 1980s and 1990s when your great grandparents were born like me, it was in His presence that he marked me. And today, 35 years later, I'm seeing that. It's his presence that will mark you. He sets it up and it's so interesting. Did you notice in the text? It said anybody who wanted to inquire of the Lord could go, anybody. But so many didn't. They would wait for Moses to go. The scripture says that when Moses went, they would stand up. Oh, we've got a lot of people that gather around Jesus circles and Christian circles and man, they are interested in the things of God. And they're gonna watch when someone else goes up. Whoo, that's interesting. They're even intrigued. There's this pillar coming down. I mean, they're even reverent. They bowed, the scripture says. So you can be interested in the things of God. You can be intrigued in the things of God. You can even be reverent towards the things of God. But the issue is, are you gonna step into the presence yourself? Or are you just gonna be busy scrolling through everyone else in the presence? Swiping through what everyone else is doing in the presence of God. I'm talking from the very person way up in the back row up there on the live stream, wherever you are in the world, you can be as close to God as you wanna be because we all have an all access pass. You don't have to watch other people like the children of Israel, they're watching Moses and yet the text said anyone that wanted to inquire could come in. You and I, obviously as New Covenant Christians, Hebrews chapter 10, Verses 19 to 23, therefore brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, He has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is through His flesh. And since we have a great high 
priests over the house of God. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering for He who promised is faithful. You and I do not have to go through anyone else. We do not have to make sacrifices. We do not have to clean ourselves up. We can enter boldly into the throne of God. You have access. You have access. You don't have to keep swiping through someone else's life. You don't have to keep envying someone else's life. You know, when I walk in here, I love it. One of the perks of being a speaker is they give me an all access pass. Imagine if I had this pass and yet I didn't ever use it. And so many of you, you've been given this because of the blood of Jesus at Calvary. You have an all access pass if you're in Christ. And yet the enemy is telling a generation, compare, compete, feel like a failure. Feel like you're not good enough. Feel like you're not smart enough. You don't have enough likes. You don't have enough followers. You don't, and Jesus is like, when did that ever have anything to do with anything? All the promises of God are in Christ Jesus. Yes and am. amen. And you've got an all access pass to the very throne room of God. You do not need to be good enough, smart enough, connected enough or talented enough because it's not about you and it's not about me. It's about King Jesus. That's who this whole thing is about. And we have an all access pass and yet so many of the children of Israel just watched. Oh, man, Moses is having a good old time with God. Moses is having a great time with God and I know Scripture speaks so highly of Moses, but anybody that wanted to inquire of the Lord, but they preferred to stay in the safety of their little tents instead of walk boldly into the place that they had access. My prayer for each and every one of you is that you learn what it is to walk boldly into the throne room of God. Jesus paid a very big price at Calvary so that we could do that. And in a world of vicarious Christianity, where we're better at spectating at Christian events than participating in the Christian journey, you get to decide how close to God you wanna be. And my prayer is that at the end of these couple of days together, there's gonna be an insatiable hunger on the inside of you to want to know the presence of God. To want to say, you know what, I've got His Word the best way to know Him. We have worship, we have prayer, we have access into the very throne room of God. And you don't have to try to get more followers to get closer to God. You don't have to get higher up any pecking order. There's no hierarchy. It's our proximity to God that prepares us for our purpose in life. Not our proximity to each other, not our proximity to who's known and who's not known. And can I get into a green room? It doesn't work like this sort of pass. You go straight into the throne room. Man, when you can go to the throne room, you don't need a green room. It's your proximity to Jesus that's gonna determine your purpose, not your proximity to anyone or anything else. If you could get a revelation of that, it would change your life. You know, the interesting thing is that it goes on in verse 11, and to me, this is the pivotal verse of the entire chapter, an often very overlooked verse. But it says in verse 11, the Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. It's so interesting, I don't have time to unpack that. Of course, we're not talking physical face to face. You'll see in scripture, we see even later in this chapter, that that's not possible for a human to do that. It means that, he spoke plainly in a way that could be very understood with Moses and it says like a friend. Do you notice that Moses talked to God not like a CEO, not like a judge, not, not like a lawyer, not like a really bad, angry dictator, but like a friend. I wonder how you speak to God because through the blood of Jesus and the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself said, I no longer call you servants, I call you 
Friends, you have access, that kind of access to God. He goes on and we normally get caught up there because he's speaking to him face to face. We're going, this is awesome. And it says, then Moses would return to the camp. He had stuff to do. He was leaving this whole deal. He had to go and keep, you know, l- lest they go build another golden calf. He's like, I better go back to the camp. His assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. Joshua would not leave this very same tent that the other people would not come into, Joshua would not leave. In other versions, that word would not leave would be rendered in many different ways, but the common usage would be lingering. He lingered in the tent. To linger is to stay in a place much longer than is required. To tarry. It's an old school world word, but that's what it means. You're just there when everyone else has gone home. <laughs> uh, you don't have to stay anymore, but you keep staying because you don't want to go anywhere else. And it says that Joshua lingered in the tent. He stayed. And I believe God's looking for a generation that when nobody else is watching, is willing to linger in the presence of God, is willing to linger in the house of God, is willing to linger a little bit longer in worship, a little bit longer in prayer, a little bit longer in the purpose and the plan of God. Do you see, we were created to linger. We have no problem lingering. Just think about the last series you binge watched. We all linger. Think about over, we just had the Christmas holidays. Man, we linger over meals with friends. No, we can all linger, we're so good at it because we're created to do it. Some of us are lingering on websites that maybe we shouldn't. Lingering in environments that we know we shouldn't. Lingering around people that maybe are not that great for us right now. Lingering in a good book, I love to linger in a good book. I love to linger with friends over a long meal. I wonder though if you love to linger in the presence of God. When was the last time? You're having a quiet time. You're like, I just really don't want this to end. I just put on music and have a worship time because I just don't want it to end. My kids will tell you, I'm so weird. So often I'm like, you know what? You you all can go, I, I just want Jesus. Not just to prepare when I'm speaking, but just because I want Him. Because nothing else is gonna satisfy. Because I'm hungry for Him. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, why? Because they will be filled. And we have a generation that has an insatiable appetite and isn't being filled because we're going to all the things that will never fill us. Oh, it promises to fill you. Keep scrolling, it's gonna fill you. Keep buying this, it's gonna fill you. Just keep playing those games, man, they're gonna fill you. Just keep acquiring and amassing more. It's gonna fill you and people are stressing out and anxious and depressed and manic because it does not deliver. You will never get from other people or things what only Jesus can give you. So he's saying hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you're gonna be filled but a lot of us, were not hungering and thirsting, certainly not after that. You know, when my kids are not well, I can always tell they're not well because they've lost their appetite. And many of us have lost our appetite for the things of God. Are we like an environment where someone can pump us up, but man, when it comes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there's no real appetite for the Word of God, for communion with God, through, for obedience to the Word of God. There's just no appetite. And just like in the natural, that's a sign of sickness in the spirit. It's a sign of spiritual sickness. And we haven't even realized we're spiritually sick and we're, we're trying to get other stuff to satisfy us. But man, that sugar, that, it's just, it, it's not satisfying. It's like when you're trying to have 
your diet filled with just sugar and carbs and stuff that's never, ever going to give you any nutritional value. Jesus goes, come to me. Hunger and thirst after my righteousness, after me. I'm the bread of life. I'm going to fill you. And you're going to everything else and everyone else, and it's not going to deliver because it can't deliver what only I can deliver. You know, the interesting thing is that place where he lingered. And some of us, I'm believing here at Passion this year, starting tonight, we're suddenly gonna go, you know what, I realize I, I don't have an appetite for that, but God, I need you to give me an appetite. And you know, just when you've been sick, you don't start after, you know, a week of not eating, you don't start with a filet, you start with chicken noodle soup. And some of us, we need God to awaken our appetite for him. Some of us, we've had an appetite, but our palate needs to change because our appetite has been for the wrong thing. And I'm believing God by the power of his spirit that he's going to literally bring change to us to say, I want to hunger and thirst after you, Lord. I want to be like the psalmist said, that my, my, my soul, Father, as a deer, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants after you, that we would be a generation that just hunger and thirst after him. Now that's the place where he lingered. I wanna show you in Deuteronomy, verse 31, verse 14 to 15, it says, the Lord said to Moses, the time of your death is now approaching. Call Joshua and present yourselves at the tent of meeting so that I may commission him. When Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves at the tent of meeting, the Lord appeared at the tent in a pillar of cloud and the cloud stood at the entrance of the tent. You go, Chris, what does this mean? And the band can come up, but let me tell you what this means. That he was in the tent of meeting and he was lingering in the presence of God. And then when the changeover and the changing of the guard was gonna happen, the Lord said, Moses, this is your time. You're not gonna go into the promised land. I do want you to know that the man that spoke to God face to face was not the person that took them into the promised land. But Joshua was raised up to take them into the promised land and the place where Joshua lingered became the place from where he was commissioned. Where you are lingering now is in a sense commissioning you. Wherever you might be, you're either being commissioned and propelled into the purpose of God for your life or away from the purpose of God. Your lingering at this moment is determining your commissioning. And I'm believing in this place, as you linger in his presence, many of you will be commissioned. Because it's when you're in his presence that you'll get a sense of where he's commissioning you. The place where he lingered when no one was watching was where he was commissioned to take a generation into their future. I wonder who God's commissioning in this place. Because in every generation, God raises up leaders to lead a generation into their future. And they're in this room. They're online, all over the world. But where you're lingering is gonna determine your commissioning. And he was commissioned. And then when the Lord in Joshua chapter one, verse five, he said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Don't be afraid. My presence will be with you. You see, Joshua didn't need the presence of Moses to go into the promised land, he needed the presence of God. You don't need my presence and you don't need anyone else's presence on social media to take you into your spiritual future. You need the presence of God Almighty to take you there. And you better know that presence. Let me wrap it up. He goes on and I'll read you verse 16. Moses from verse 15, he says, if your presence doesn't go, Moses responded to him, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favour with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. Moses is saying there's only one thing that separates us from everyone else. Only one thing. Not our social media profile and how beautifully curated our profiles are, not how cool our clothes are, not how relevant we are and how trendy we are. No, that's not what separates us from a lost and a broken world. The distinctive 
mark for a Jesus follower is that we carry the presence of God. The same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives on the inside of us. Wherever we go, we ought to be producing love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, patience, long-suffering, self-control in a world that is out of control. That's what ought to mark a generation. Your friends are like, man, how can you be so full of peace when the world's out of control? How can you be so full of love in a hate-filled world? Man, how can you have so much self-control when everything's saying do what you wanna do? How can you be so good when the world's so bad? How can you have so much patience when, man, we want everything yesterday. Hey God, it's the fruit of the Spirit of the living God that lives on the inside of me. Moses goes, there's a distinctive for the people of God, of course, as New Testament followers of Jesus. There ought to be a distinctive about us and don't mistake what that distinctive is. Don't mistake relevance with being distinct. Consecration and holiness is what sets us apart. It's consecration and holiness, it's not coolness. And he says, Whoa. God, God, we need your presence. Because in 2023, what's gonna make us distinct in a world that is out of control, politically and socially and morally and environmentally and economically and sociologically, this world is spiraling out of control. How will people know that I am your follower? He says, my presence. It's my presence, not your coolness, not your relevance, although we ought to be, because we're living in 2023, not 1956, so please be relevant. But that's not the goal of Christianity. It's a byproduct of being alive on the earth in this hour. That's why we present it like this. Because we're living in this world in this time. But consecration and holiness are what mark us. And finally, especially for leaders watching online and leaders in the room, you've had a hard few years. God bless you if you're still involved in young adult, student, college ministry. But there was a moment when in verse 21 to 23, the Lord says to Moses, He goes on and says, the Lord said, here is a place near me, you're to stand on the rock and when my glory, which the Lord also said was His goodness, Moses said, show me your glory. He says, my goodness will pass by you. God's a good God, His glory and His goodness. He goes, my, he goes on, sorry, he says, the Lord, here is a place near me, you to stand on the rock and when my glory passes by, I will put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I'll take my hand away and you will see my back, but my face will not be seen. Now, of course, this is not like a back, like a spine. It's more like if you have the image of a comet. You sort of see a trace. God's like, you kind of, that's what you'll see. But he says, I'm gonna put you in the crevice of a rock and I'm gonna cover you with my hand. So when he's in that crevice and when he's covered, it's really dark. And he didn't see the Lord pass by till he saw his back pass by. And some of you in the last few years, you thought because of the darkness and the challenge and the pain and the suffering and the hurt and the disappointment and the discouragement and just being in a very dark place, you thought God took His hand off you and you have been wondering and in turmoil, am I still even supposed to do this? Did God call me? What is going on? And there's so much confusion. And the Lord's like, no, 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 I didn't take my hand off you. I had my hand on you and I was covering you. I was protecting you. It's been a cray cray five or six or seven years and you thought I took my hand off you because of the dark place you were in, but I was protecting you. Some of you on the verge of thinking, this is my last passion because God, I don't even know if I'm meant to do this. I just wanna speak to you. 
say he didn't take his hand off you. He's covering you, protecting you. And you are going to see in 2023, you were with me the whole time. So I wonder in this room, right up to the very back, online, wherever you are in the world, I mean, this is just gonna go from strength to strength to strength, every talk, every session. But I wonder if right at the outset on night one, for those that can acknowledge, man, I haven't even had that appetite <laughs> for His presence. I, I love every now and again coming to a gathering or a meeting, but Lord, I, I want my appetite stimulated. Some of you have been taking appetite suppressants in the spirit realm. And it's time to say, oh, Holy Spirit, I need you to work on the inside of me and stimulate my hunger for God again. Some of you, tonight it's like saying, Lord, put in me a hunger to linger in your presence more than anything else. That the things of this world truly will grow strangely dim in the light of your Incredible, incredible glory, your incredible grace, your incredible face. I can't do that for you. You can either choose whether you're gonna be like the people that watch Moses go in, or you can say, you know what, I'm getting up and I'm using my all access pass and I'm going in and like Joshua, I'm gonna to learn to linger in the presence. And as I linger in the presence, I'm gonna trust God to commission me wherever he wants to commission me. But God, I don't want the promise without the presence. I don't want the provision without the presence. And I don't wanna go anywhere if your presence doesn't go with me. I want the presence of God.